it's pretty tough to cover the trial and all of that stuff in 45 minutes, but uh, there were so many witnesses, defense witnesses, prosecution witnesses, and it was a long trial. <clears throat> but I'll, I'll try to cover as much as I can. Uh, first off, to set the scene, uh, after the, the first thing that occurred, as they said, was the Coast Guard Board of Inquiry, which happened almost days right after the uh, sinking in Baltimore at the captain of the port's office. And uh, the captain of the port was a uh, four-striper named Captain Cabernacle. And he was an old salt, and he'd been in the business a long time, and he was pretty much towards the end of his career. <clears throat> and uh, his job was the responsibility of looking over safety and so forth uh, on the Chesapeake Bay. He uh, also um, had run into John many times, had discussions. He had very, a lot of concerns about the Marvel, but there wasn't anything he could do because the legislation at the time didn't affect the Marvel. Uh, sailing vessels under, what, 700 gross tons were not subject to Coast Guard inspection, so you could buy one and take out a 1,000 passengers if you wanted to, and, and they couldn't do much about it as long as it was sail. There was this, was this provision, though, that the Cabernacle thought if they used the yawl boat to push with it, then it was no longer operating as sail at that time, and they were paying passengers on board. And it was actually technically <clears throat> a motor vessel. Well, he and John Meckling had go-rounds, and they really hated each other. <laughs> Tremendously bad feelings between them, which was not a good situation. And uh, he actually uh, wrote Coast Guard headquarters and said that he, he thought the vessel should be shut down. And in his opinion, it was uh, not seaworthy and so forth. And Coast Guard headquarters came back and sent a copy of the letter to John as well and said, no, uh, that's the regulations. He's free to operate. Uh, we can't do anything about it. Uh, so anyway, that was the scene as far as uh, the Board of Inquiry. They had a panel of, uh, uh, I don't know, three or four captains. And uh, their job was to gather and make recommendations to the Commandant of the Coast Guard, who was, Vice, uh, who was Admiral Richmond. Well, he was actually Vice Admiral at the time. They didn't, Commandant didn't have a four-star. And, uh, uh, and then he would make recommendations as to whether to prosecute and so forth. Uh, so um, the... Uh, Right after the Board of Inquiry, the House Merchant Marine Fisheries Committee uh, had a meeting, a joint session over in Congress, and uh, everybody was there, the Commandant, as well as uh, Meckling, and I was there with him. Uh, and uh, the Congress wanted to uh, hear from the Captain and hear about the situation because um, the uh, Coast Guard had been working on legislation, which was the Bonner Act. Uh, at the time, I think they'd already been working two years before this came up, and of course the Marvel brought this whole thing to a head. So Congress wanted to hear directly from the captain and also wanted to hear from the Coast Guard as to what they were, they were going to do. And so John showed up and uh, they interviewed him. One of the senators said, uh, uh, Captain, he said, did your vessel have any rot in it? And John said, well, Senator, do you live in a wooden house? And the Senator said, uh, yes, I do, Captain. I live in a wooden house. And John said, well, I would imagine your house has some rot in it somewhere. And he said, that may be true, Captain. He said, but I don't take people for rides in my house. So, <laughs> uh, you know, you don't overdo the Senators. They're pretty sharp characters. Well, the Commandant's Coast Guard's testimony at that time was, which was actually basically what really, really uh, helped uh, 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 the Coast Guard to lose the case in a way. Uh, his testimony was that he felt that any vessel, whether it was sail or wood or power or steel or uh, uh, fiberglass or whatever, that uh, any vessel uh, uh, would have foundered under the same conditions, caught in those conditions. 
So at that time, the Coast Guard had a series of charges. The radio didn't operate, and the portholes didn't work, and the life jackets were dated, and it goes on and on and on. They had this big shopping list of things that were uh, wrong with it. And uh, uh, they wanted the basic charge was uh, basically that the vessel was unseaworthy. So <laughs> the crux of the trial basically came down to when it finally went to court was, well, didn't the, didn't the commandant say that it didn't make any difference whether it was seaworthy or not, that any vessel would have foundered under the same conditions. So the bottom line is, what was he doing out there? Did the captain make a bad decision in taking it out? Was it his fault? Is he responsible because of that? Because if he'd taken a brand new vessel out, the same thing would have happened, according to the commandant. At any rate, um, the, uh, com com the Coast Guard eventually uh, decided that uh, uh, it should go to trial and he should be charged. And they turned the case over to the uh, United States attorneys in Baltimore. And uh, this was uh, in January, February, and uh, charged, charged him. They took the Coast Guard's charges and whittled them down into two basic charges. One was taking an unseaworthy vessel to sea, endangering the lives of passengers and crew, and the other one was taking an unseaworthy vessel to sea, responsible for the lives of passengers and crew. So in other words, the second charge was a manslaughter charge. And the first one was an endangerment charter, a charge, and I think there was actually uh, legislation at that time that basically talked about endangerment, operating a vessel in an endangered manner and so forth that existed. The only, uh, the only uh, uh, case they had to go by was, uh, as a precedent, was there was a sailboat coming up the Chesapeake Bay in the 1890s and uh, one of the crew members fell out of the fell out of the rigging and hit the gunwale and went over the side. And the captain refused to stop the vessel and search for him. And uh, went right on into Baltimore. And the crew turned him in, and he was charged with uh, responsible for the life. And that was the only precedent they had in 1891 case. So it was a brand new situation in this legislature. Uh, legislation was was pending in in uh, in uh, Congress at the time. The reason the legislation hadn't passed was because the uh, they were getting a lot of congressional uh, pressure against passing it, putting regulation on civilian uses. The Coast Guard had primarily been World War II merchant marine licensing the merchant marine, inspecting, inspecting the merchant vessels and so forth, and they hadn't been paying a whole lot of attention to the civilian world because most people didn't own boats in that in that time. You know, after the war, and it, it wasn't a big problem. But these little cases started showing up little by little, where people were taking people out fishing and in boats that were not like there was a case in Long Island, I think, where. Uh, five or six people dr uh, drowned because they just on a fishing trip and whatnot. But the reason the politicians were against it, and some of you people who live down here can understand it, uh, the oystermen and the fishermen and everything, they didn't want any regulation. <laughs> they hadn't had a regulation for hundreds of years and they weren't going to take it now, so they put the pressure on their congressmen and senators, leave us alone, we don't need any regulation here because that it would have affected them also. And so that was the reason they had a tough time getting it through. Well, at any rate, uh, the, uh, after the Board of Inquiry, uh, the, and then the, finally the, uh, it was all in the newspapers, and of course it was very dramatic in the newspapers, and somebody mentioned the article from the Washington paper, which I read, and there's a lot of inaccuracies in that, because what, what papers did in those days is they tend to co look at the other one and just copy one and so forth instead of getting out, and, you know, getting off their butts and getting out of there and checking the stories themselves. They just copied one another. And uh, 
So John and I, we were down in Victor Haven at his house, and he got a call on the phone. This is before, this is when the commandant recommended that it go to trial, be turned over to the state's attorney. And we got a call from a guy named uh, Harry Katz, uh, Judge Katz. Interesting, his no, name was Harry uh, Leward Katz. And if people are voting people, you know what, what Leward or Leward means. You know, it's the lee side of a vessel, so he had a part of a vessel's name in, in his name, which made uh, the whole trial, I think, was the most interesting, would make the most interesting movie because it was very perimationist in some ways. It was really strange. Uh, but at any rate, uh, Harry Katz called us up and said, uh, would you come on up here to Baltimore? Uh, I'm thinking I'd like to represent you. And uh, even Steve and I, who were the two other crew members, had a charge against us, failure to have a port security card. And a port security card was uh, uh, something that was left over from World War II where all merchant seamen had to have a card to get on the piers and docks so it wasn't sabotage and all that sort of thing. And eventually they had done away with it. It had pretty dated by that time. Today, it's, they have a similar card called a Twix card, which allows you to get on piers and so forth. But at any rate, um, so we went up to Katz's office, and he, it was something like out of a movie. We went in this really dark little room, and there was this desk sitting there, a very small room, desk sitting there, a couple of chairs in front of it, and papers piled up so high and you could just see his head over top of these papers you know like one of these old detective movies or something and he was sitting back there looking and he said tell me all about it tell me the story so john told him the what he knew the whole story and so forth and cat said you know he he was a guy who had been active and retired and if you read the book of course you get his background and so forth he was one of these guys that was a fair deal kind of lawyer you know and uh, so after John told him the story he uh, he said well he said uh, you're going to get hung and you're going to get hung badly he's a matter of fact they may draw and quarter you and set you on fire and burn you out of town you're going to spend 5,000 years in jail and you're not getting out of this you're a murderer you know kind of thing he says you have real troubles because the way the papers and the Baltimore Sun and so forth are playing this thing up you know they'd actually gone down to the city dock and taken cameras and took pictures of the little doll babies in the back windows of the cars that were parked there and stuff like that. So the public was out for blood. But Katz said, uh, if you let me, he said, I'd like to represent you pro bono. Well, of course, he hadn't had any cases. And he'd retired. This was his retired office. But of course, if he could win this case, this would be the case of a lifetime for a guy who was not a big judge. As a matter of fact, I think he was a traffic court judge and some other things like that. But uh, so John said, OK. So he would take it. At any rate, it went to trial uh, in January. The district attorney, as I tell people, looked like a character out of a, of a, uh, uh, a 1900 year law yearbook, you know, had to slick down here and part in the middle and so forth. And then uh, uh, the Coast Guard had a representative there uh, to back up the, the attorney, yeah, uh, state's attorney, and uh, his name was Lieutenant Commander Joseph Gagneau. And he sat behind them, and every now and then he would roll up and whisper in their ear when they were asking questions and so forth. The judge they drew was a guy named R. Dorsey Watkins, who was a very, very, uh, turned out to be, actually, he, he came out to be the uh, chief judge of the Baltimore court uh, and in the end of his career. But uh, Dorsey Watkins uh, got the job. Number one is he'd never sailed in his life. Number two, he'd only been on a boat once. Uh, he was on the governor's yacht for uh, cocktails one time, and it never left the dock. And that was the extent of his knowledge about boating. So the first week in court was basically taking up with teaching Judge Watkins how to sail. 
uh, how sailboats worked, why you couldn't tack this way or go this way, why you needed wind from here and there, and that sort of thing, and, and uh, educating. Um, so uh, that was kind of interesting. Uh, he also stated at the beginning of the case, I'm not going to be watching the news, I'm not going to read newspapers, I'm not going to listen to anything, any words or any conversation about this case will be talked about in this courtroom where everybody hears it. So he was, a, he was really a first class, excellent, fair judge. Uh, I'm going to go through some of the witnesses to tell you basically as I said, it'd be hard to get it all in here, but I go through who some of the people we had. I think it was 20, 25 defense witnesses and the same number of prosecution witnesses. Interestingly enough, none of the passengers uh, testified against the captain. Uh, after the whole thing was over, the trial was all over. One family did bring a civil suit uh, against him, but they dropped it very rapidly. Unfortunately, and the reason I'm up to talk about the case is it was long and it was never transcribed. It was always in the stenographer's notes, so there's no record of it anymore. So it's all basically out of my memory as to what the, what the case was about. Uh, the first witnesses they called, they had a couple divers from the Naval Academy that went down right after the sinking to uh, check the vessel out. And uh, the first diver said, uh, I know it was 11J Marvel because I saw the name on the transom. And I got up and I swam through the boat. The decks were gone. It was just a complete shell. The mast were gone and out of it. And I swam through it and there was just nothing there at all. And then he says, I got off and went down to the side on the outside of the vessel and looked over and saw a porthole. And he says, I reached over and I grabbed this porthole and just tore it right out of the side of the ship with my bare hands. He said the ship was so rotten, I just grabbed it and pulled it on through. And so Watkins, Judge Watkins, was uh, um, had the plans to the ship in front of him that he got from Booth Brothers, and he's looking at it, and he said, now let me see, you just reached in and pulled that porthole right through the ship, and the way a porthole's designed, you know, is a, what comes through the front, but there's a big flange in the back. And so he said, you're telling me you pulled a 14 inch porthole through a 10 inch hole. And the guy said, well, yeah, I just came right in. And you just ripped it out with your bare hands. Yes, sir, that's what I did. And he says, and, and what did you do with it then? He said, well, I swam it up to the surface. Well, the thing weighed about 30 pounds or 40 pounds. That would have been difficult in itself. So at any rate, he said, okay, that was his testimony. The second diver from the Naval Academy got on and he said, uh, I went down, I knew it was 11J Marvel because I saw the name on the stern. So he'd obviously been prepped to what to say by the district attorney. And he said, I had a crowbar with me, so I wanted to make sure I didn't get stuck in anything, any of the rigging or anything down there. And so he says, I walked along the deck, and I just took the crowbar and stuck it down through the deck, and it was rotted. Boy, he says, no problem. Well, I could just drop it. And the judge said, hold on, hold on, back up a minute. The last diver said there weren't any decks on it. He said, no, no, sir, your honor. He said, most of the decking was still on it and everything. You could walk around on it. And so Watkins said, well, uh, that's interesting. He said, uh, uh, you, had a, you had a crowbar with you, yes. And he said, no, you didn't take that crowbar and go off the side of the ship and pry one of those portholes out, did you? <laughs> and the porthole that you brought up and so forth, oh, no, sir, I, I didn't do that and everything. Well, the, the more his testimony went on, the more the two drivers didn't agree at all. So Watkins said, I'll tell you what, and he said to the clerk who was recording, he said, I'll tell you what, he said, they got so much conflicting testimony here from two guys that uh, he said, I'm going to disallow both of their testimony, strike it from the record. So they got stricken out you know, right off the bat. Uh, then they had this expert witness they called in from who was a master mariner. I think his certificate was listed as master mariner, all oceans, all rivers, worldwide, 
old guy, had been around for years and years and been everywhere and done everything. And and he really, uh, you know, he just thought the decisions that the captain had made, he wouldn't have made it, particularly in that type of water and so forth. And But he'd been in, in everywhere around the world and, and was just an absolute expert. And Judge Katz was one of these clever old guys that, you know, I don't know how he, he if I could describe him, he was just a fascinating mind, always working, trying to figure out what, uh, you know, what people were up to. And uh, so uh, he uh, went up and said to this guy on the stand, he said, uh, now you've been everywhere in the world and, you know, all the, all the, Tributaries, so yes, sir, been everywhere. And he said, Well, he says, Have you ever sailed in the Chesapeake Bay? And the guy said, No, sir, I haven't. <laughs> and then Judge Katz said, uh, That's all, Your Honor, thank you, and sat down. <laughs> so it kind of completely negated this guy's testimony because the Chesapeake Bay could be different, you know. Everybody, as he said, the guy himself, he said, Everybody, everybody of water is different. Well, you never sailed in the Chesapeake, so how would you know? So his testimony got kind of thrown out. And uh, so uh, I guess one of the stories, uh, I don't, cause I don't want to run out of time, applies to uh, local, the locals themselves. We had heard that somebody, the Coast Guard testified that, they, that the radio was inoperative. And we knew the radio was operative because people, we used to call the Norfolk Marine operator and put in calls. People call their families at home all the time. And we kept it on the Coast Guard frequency in those days. It was AM radio with 2182, it was normally where, where we kept it. So, but it's possible that during the storm and the wind, you know, the, the antenna had gotten damaged somehow and didn't transmit as well. But uh, the uh, people on the ship said that they didn't hear anything. But then uh, we'd heard that somebody down around Chesapeake Beach or Deal or somewhere had heard radio transmission, Mayday, Mayday, this is 11J Marvel, Mayday. And it named Marshall somehow or other was connected with it. And uh, so John and I one night after the trial said, let's go down and let's go down that area and sit around and smoke, uh, sit around and uh, go to a bar or something and see maybe we can hear hear something. And we did. We went down and we were sitting there having a few beers and heard name Marshall come up. And I went over to the table and I said, is there a Marshall? Yeah, there's a Marshall's boatyard here. And uh, Mr. Marshall lives there. And uh, it's down at the end of the road here. So we got in a car and went down knocked on the door and this gentleman answered the door and he said he was Mr. Marshall. I think it was John Marshall, I don't know. I'm trying to remember, but uh, we said, we, this is John Meckling, he's on trial here. You know, they're gonna put him away for 75,000 years and so forth. So if anybody heard that transmission, we need to have them testify. And he said, I don't know anything about that. It certainly doesn't affect us. And we said, come on now, if you really know something, you have to let us know because we've got to have testimony. And uh, <clears throat> his wife was sitting on the couch and she said, let him in, John. So he backed off and opened the door and we went in and sat down. And she said, I'll tell you what the situation is. She said, my son heard it, he's young and he has a, very shy, very scared, and he has a very bad speech impediment. And he heard the transmission, and I'm not about to have him put on the stand in front of the public with the whole New York Times and everybody that you can imagine there and put my son on, on trial. We worked so hard, you know, to get his confidence and his speech up and so forth, and we're just not about to put him on trial. It's not gonna happen. So we said, well, maybe maybe we can hear it in the judge's chambers or something like that. It would be, you know, protect him. And she said, no, I don't think so. But I'll tell you what, we'll give it to my husband. I will talk it over and give it some thought. So the next day, we're sitting at the, at the defense table. And the bailiff comes over and says, there's a Mr. Marshall outside in the lobby that would like to speak to you. So uh, Judge Katz asked for a recess for 10 minutes and 
judge said, fine. And we went outside, and it was him and his son. And he said, look, if you try to really do this right and not cause any damage, he'll, he, he will testify. So we brought him in <clears throat> and sat him down in the uh, witness stand. And the uh, judge didn't want to hear it in chambers because, as he said, he wanted everything that was ever said heard in that courtroom by everybody. So uh, at any rate, they asked the kid, they said, uh, would you state your name for the record, please? And, and he was, you know, just, you know, couldn't talk. So the bailiff was pretty smart, so he took him, handed him a piece of paper and said, look, he says, you don't have to say anything, just write your name on this piece of paper. So he wrote down John Marshall or whatever it was. And then the bailiff said, uh, now son, he says, that two L's or one L's? And he got talking with him and got him all loosened up. So finally, uh, he thought he was ready. So they said, can you tell us what happened that day? He said, yeah, I was helping my father in a boat yard secure boats. We heard the hurricane was coming. And I went up to the shack to get some more line, and we had a Zenith transoceanic radio in the in the uh, shop, and it was uh, on the Coast Guard frequency. And I said I was getting this line, and I heard Mayday, Mayday. This is 11J Marvel, Mayday. And he said, and I got the line, and he said I took it back down to my father, and the judge said, Well, did you? Did you say anything? Did you tell your father about it? And he said, no, I didn't say anything at all. And he said, well, why not? And he said, well, I didn't understand what the message was. He says it was August, and somebody saying May Day, May Day. It didn't make any sense to me, so I just ignored it. So he was the only one that had heard that transmission. And if he could have put it over to the Coast Guard, they probably could have done something. Because at the same time the Marvel went down, there was a freighter, a uh, slag boat in the, st in the uh, bay that sank. You know, the Robert LaForest or something like that was the name of it. And this was all at the same time the Marvel was having its problems. And they got their, their radio and got to the Coast Guard and got rescued off of that out of the bay. So the Coast Guard probably could have done something in one way or another to help. So at any rate, after John said that he didn't understand the, the May Day, that was, uh, that was a real uh, heart sinker right there. Um, a couple weeks before the uh, Marvel sang, we had a group on board of about 40 kids uh, from Dayton, Ohio. Uh, it was called the Traveling University. And uh, the, what it was was a religious group, uh, Reverend Faye Lameadows ran it. He took these kids every summer to a particular place for a week, and they would uh, explore. Everyone would go out little committees during the day in the town or wherever it was and find out who the mayor was and how the town operated. And then at the nighttime, they would get together and discuss it, and everybody could learn about it. Well, they chose the marvel because of all the different stops. We had Oxford, Cambridge, St. Michael's, and so forth. And uh, so the Traveling University came on board, and a bunch of kids, and we had a real good time, fun, you know. I mean, the description on it, you know, when time was good, was, yeah, it was beautiful night. The stars were out, and was, you could be sailing at night, and, and the water, all those things were true. I mean, you know, when you weren't in trouble, obviously. And we passed the old Bay Line. I don't know how many of you remember the Baltimore Steam Packet Company. I used to ride it between, we called it the Norfolk Night Boat. I used to ride it between Baltimore and Norfolk at times for the Coast Guard. And we'd pass them at nighttime, and they'd be all lit up, heading their way down to Norfolk, and they'd put their spotlight on us and say, here's the old 11J Marvel still going after all these years and so forth. But at any rate, uh, Reverend Lameadows came up to me and said, you know, he said, I want all these kids to get up for sunrise. He said, I want them to see a sunrise at sea. So I want them up as soon as it happens. So, okay. So Steve and I, in the next morning, go around knocking on all the cabin doors. Okay, everybody up on deck and whatnot. And all these kids in their bathrobes, you know, oh, God. 
all right, all right, get up. So we got up on deck and we sat there and we watched the east and we were waiting for the sun to come up. And the uh, sun finally came up and as it was there, three seagulls flew by and Reverend Lametto said, see children, he says, that's faith, hope and charity. And I thought to myself, boy, I mean, you know, <laughs> I was fast. That was great. You know, I'm not anti-religious, but it was kind of a little bit uh, out of the way. At any rate, uh, during the trial, one day, John and I were sitting out in the lobby waiting to get started, for the trial to get started, and there was a magazine there, and uh, it sort of had like little stories in it and everything, but it was colored and so forth. And... Uh, I think I have a copy of it here, if I can find it. This magazine we're sitting there reading, waiting to go in. Here it is. And it had like a color thing in it. I tore it out because I looked at it and I said, John, take a look at this. It says, uh, Fortune tellers, three seagulls flying overhead at sea are a regard of birds of ill omen foretelling disaster for somebody aboard a ship. I said, can you believe that? Faith, hope, and charity. <laughs> I brought it back all those months, you know, faith, hope, and charity, and there it is. That was the actual article that I found. And it's just, uh, again, the whole trial thing, you know, it really had some strange <laughs> aspects to it. So, let me get, uh, let me get to Pinky. Pinky was the cook, and he was an excellent cook. He, uh, he reminded me of Uncle Remus. He was a black guy with silver hair, and he was about the same age as Uncle Remus would have been, you know, and he adopted Steve and I, always had little card tricks and special food and everything for us. I used to go shopping with him, and uh, there was an Acme market there, and buy fish and things, and I'd always say, oh, I like this fish here, and he said, no, don't buy that one, buy one with all bones in it, and I said, why? He said, because people eat less, they have to take the bones out of it, it's not as bad, <laughs> and he said, you know, I was a, I was a chef for Hubert Heaver, he he always called him Hubert Heaver, he said, I was in the Navy, and I was a chef for Hubert Heaver, and whatnot, so... Uh, Pinky uh, always bragged about his crab cakes and how good they were and so forth. So uh, the, uh, they put him on the stand and they said uh, during the trial, and they said, now Mr. Pinkney, his name was Elroy Pinkney. And Mr. Pinkney said, uh, the judge said, I'd like to know what was going on with the crew. You were part of the crew. What was the crew doing prior to the thinking when things really got, you know, uh, rough. And Pinky said, well, um, uh, I was getting ready to make crab cakes for lunch. He said, I was going to do these crab cakes. And I had my, all my stuff prepared up there in the galley and so forth. And, uh, and I, used, I used this. And so when the judge said, hold on a minute, he said, I, I, that's fine. He said, but I really want to know, what was the other crew doing? Were they running pumps? Were they helping out? What were the passengers doing? And so forth. And he said, yes, sir, yes, sir. He said, they had pumps down below. They put a pump down there, and the water seemed to be coming in the front. And uh, and uh, I was up in the galley, and I, it was rolling, you know, and I used oil. And I don't want that to ruin my crab cakes. And one night he goes on, and uh, the judge said, well, let's try one more time. And tell me exactly what the crew was doing. So he takes off, and he describes a few little things and it immediately gets back to his crab cakes. <laughs> and obviously he was, didn't want to testify. <laughs> he was trying to protect us, you know. So the judge said, Mr. Pinckney, he said, I am willing to admit you probably make the finest crab cakes in the state of Maryland. And a matter of fact, when this trial is over, I want you to make me some of those crab cakes. <laughs> And he said, so would you please try to tell me what the crew was up to? And so Pinky, yes sir, yes sir. So he starts off and within minutes he was back in a crab cake. <laughs> the judge finally said, does anybody else have any questions of this witness? And they let him go and his Pinky came back past the 
table we were on the witness side, I mean the defense side, as Pinky went by, he looked over at us and gave us a big wink, so he figured like he did pretty good up there on the stand. But that was one of the more funnier times of the, of the uh, trial. Uh, the flag and the hurricane warnings is an important part. The yacht, yacht uh, dock master at the Cambridge Yacht Club uh, got up and he testified. He said, the, I got word from the Weather Bureau, the Friendship Airport Weather Bureau told us to take down the hurricane warnings and put up storm warnings. And he said, about an hour after I took the hurricane warnings down and put up the storm warnings, he said, the Marvel set sail, left, left port. And uh, that was one of the reasons I didn't get back on it. I was on it Monday and I went back ashore. I was meeting with this group of investors that were interested in the boat and I was supposed to rejoin them Thursday. But by the time I drove down and got back down to Cambridge, they'd left already. But at any rate, uh, that was the yacht, yacht master, the yacht uh, guy's testimony that the hurricane warnings were taken down, storm warnings up, Marvel left a half an hour later. So the next day they had him back on the stand again and the district attorney had him on the stand and he said, I'd like him to clarify his testimony from yesterday and the judge said, what's that? And so the harbor master said, well, he said, I, I guess I had it backwards. He said, actually what happened was the Marvel set sail and then an hour later I took down the hurricane warnings and put up the storm warnings. And Judge Watkins said, well, uh, why did you testify the other way yesterday? Were you wrong? Or, and he said, no, sir. He said, I thought I was right. He says, but that guy over there told me I had it backwards. I was wrong. And he points right at the district attorney. <laughs> so Watkins says, fine, we'll keep your testimony the way it was yesterday. And uh, that sort of thing. I have to say that the, the uh, Coast Guard uh, was really playing hardball. They were playing really, really hard because they needed this case badly in order to try to get this legislation through. As a matter of fact, they had given Steve and me orders to be out at sea in the North Atlantic at the time of the trial, so we couldn't be there. They were going to put us on the Chincoteague, Coast Guard Cutter Chincoteague out of Norfolk. And Judge Cass, who was old Republican connections when he was a younger guy, uh, knew Richard Nixon pretty well, who was vice president at that time. So he called Richard Nixon, and the next thing we know, we get a new set of orders, or TAD orders from the Coast Guard, canceling our Chincoteague trip to the North Atlantic to be at the trial, be available. They didn't want us there because what had happened was, after the ship sank, uh, we had the Coast Guard Board of Inquiry, and uh, on September 28th, which is right at the Marvel sank on the 12th of August. September 28th, we were both in boot camp up at Coast Guard. And boot camp in Cape May, we joined the Coast Guard. So they obviously didn't want us there in Coast Guard uniforms testifying <laughs> against them, you know, on the other side. They wanted to get rid of us, get us out of there. As a matter of fact, the charges they had against us about failure to have a port security car, they just dropped them and said, okay, forget those charges, because <laughs> we were already in the service at the time. Uh, so at any rate, uh, the Booth brothers, the shipyard people testified. Uh, the, uh, let's see what else we got here. I got, uh, the Coast Guard said that the they had never been on board, they never inspected the ship, they weren't allowed to, and in no case, not just no Coast Guard personnel had ever been on board the ship. Well, we knew that some of them had come down, all these come alongside all the time, come in for lunch, and we would sit and talk and everything, but they weren't inspecting or anything, but Captain Carabinacle insisted that if, even if that had occurred, that, that the, uh, there would have been a record made of it that they had been on board, and, you know, and, uh, and on the ship. And he said, we have all the records and we have no record of ever have sending any, putting anybody on the Marvel. So uh, we got a phone call that night. This is all in the newspapers. We got a phone call that night from a girl up in New York who had taken a cruise a year before. 
And she said, I got some eight millimeter movies of the Coast Guard coming on board. Would you like to have them? I'll get them down to you. And we said, sure, bring them down. So uh, send them down. So they came, they came the next day, special delivery. And uh, we looked at them, and there was what we were talking about. And so we, uh, Katz asked, uh, Judge Watkins said, uh, uh, can I, I receive some movies that I'd like to show? And the district attorney immediately, oh, I object, I don't know how to, I, what are these? You know, they could be doctored films or whatever they are. He really lost it. And uh, uh, the uh, judge said, well, uh, we don't know until we see them. So if you if bailiff, get these curtains closed and get some movie cameras up here, let's take a look at them. So at any rate, they put the movies on, and sure enough, here's the Coast Guard coming on board and so forth, and Steve and me acting like idiots with our pirate hats and all that sort of thing. <laughs> we're, you got to remember, we were 18, 19 years old at the time. So uh, anyway, it kind of negated what the Coast Guard was saying. But where it finally came down to in the end, two things happened. And these are the two important things about the trial. There were a lot of other witnesses, and a lot of humorous things happened, a lot of sad things happened. But the uh, two things that were really important was uh, Judge Katz was thinking, and he said, you know, it's just taking this unseaworthy vessel to sea is an irrelevant thing in this trial. The trial is, why did Meckling take it out there in the first place? Yeah, what caused him to take it out there? And uh, so uh, let's call the commandant to the Coast Guard to the stand. So they uh, called over and he said, I don't have to. I don't have to appear if I don't want to. So again, another call to Nixon, and uh, who was vice president. And the next day the commandant was over on the stand. And uh, so... Judge Katz just took out the congressional record and said, let me see here. Was this your statement? Uh, any vessel, whether it was sail, power, blah, 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 you know, whatever it was, would have foundered under the same conditions. And he said, yes, sir, I made that statement. He said, fine, no further questions. The second thing he says now, why was he out there? And this is getting pretty close to the end of the trial. and. Katz said, you know, somebody had to make call that shot and tell the Weather Bureau to take down those warnings and put up, and who was it? So he subpoenaed the head of the Weather Bureau to come in the trial. And he asked him, he said, well, yes, sir, we were watching it, and it was going in and it was going out, and, you know, the storm and so forth, and it was going to pass on the Washington, D.C. side. Well, if it had passed on the Washington, D.C. side, uh, as hurricanes move counterclockwise, it would have been winds coming out of the southwest instead of the northeast, which John thought might be a, a, a partially a good way to get over to the, uh, in Herring Bay and get leave from the shore on that side. But it didn't turn out that way, of course. But at any rate, he, the guy from the Weather Bureau said, no, we just... He said, well, you didn't make the decision, did you? You're the head of it. And he said, well, no, I didn't exactly. I didn't make the decision. He said, well, why did you do it? He said, well, I got a call from a state senator. said that uh, unless I could prove that the storm definitely was going to come up and hit our area, uh, the storm warnings need to, uh, the hurricane warnings needed to come down. And he said, well, why, why would he do that? And well, he got pressure from the mayor of Ocean City, Maryland. It was going to be a, it was a Friday coming up. It was August. It was a big season. They are making money. And if the hurricane warnings were up, Ocean City, Maryland would have been hit financially pretty big. So we agreed with him. We took the warnings down. So Judge Watkins takes a look at all this and says, hey, the uh, Coast Guard also said he didn't have a barometer, uh, you know, uh, and uh, if he'd had a barometer, he would have known there was a storm coming. Well, as it turns out, 
it was a low over the whole area for the whole week and a barometer wouldn't make any difference. It hardly changed at all. But but uh, judge said, you know, uh, how would you expect this guy with a barometer to know more than the millions of dollars that the, that the government, that the public spends in tax dollars and projecting weather, but this guy with the barometer is gonna know the difference. Number two is he sees the warnings coming down. He sees the winds, hey, maybe I can make it. If they're coming in from the south. I can make it over to Annapolis or South River or at least somewhere over there. That was his reasoning. It didn't turn out to be that way, but that was his reasoning. So in a summary, there's a, we do have the judge's opinion. The judge says, uh, kind of reminds me of a guy uh, standing in a burning room. Room catches on fire and he turns around, sees the door and runs out that door and when he gets outside there's a bunch of people standing out there and said why don't you take the other door it was right behind you and he said it's kind of like that it's a lot of Monday morning quarterbacking going on here and he said I can he said I think and it's in his opinion here he says I think that the captain took all the prudent decisions he could with the information he had even though the information was incorrect so he said I'm going to find him innocent on the manslaughter charge, which is taking an unseaworthy vessel to sea, which was irrelevant, uh, and uh, uh, responsible for the lives of passengers and crew. He said, but I'm going to have to find a second charge endangering the lives of passengers and crew. I'm going to have to find him guilty on that. He said, you know, it's not too much different than when you take somebody for a ride in their car, you endanger their life and so forth. But he said, you know, I have to find, find him responsible for a part of this. He can't get off scot-free. But he's lost everything. He doesn't have anything. He's finished. He's wiped up, you know. And uh, so I'm going to put him on a year's uh, probation. And he can't operate vessels and so forth like that. And so uh, that was his final decision, uh, what he came down with. So... Afterwards, John and I went down to the probation office to get him registered with his probation officer. And um, we were there for maybe two hours. And uh, the, at the end of the time, we were leaving with his wife and his boy. He had a child who was uh, 11 years old at the time. We were walking down the courthouse steps, and it was already out in the papers, sun papers by then. The kid was down there, extra, extra, read all about it, a captain, you know, exonerated on this and convicted, so forth, whatnot. The picture of John on the front of the newspaper, and John said to me, and he says, hold on a minute, and he goes down and says, let me have one of those papers, kids, and yes, sir, and he gives him a paper, and he gives him five bucks, thanks, mister, appreciate it, it was extra, extra, you know, he never <laughs> looked at the front of the paper, wait a minute, this is the guy that's on the front of, the, front of this piece of paper, you know, and we went, I don't know, that kid never knew who it was he sold that paper to, but, uh, the trial in itself, and I say over time, the trial in itself, uh, so many other things happened that were really, really, really interesting, and, and it would make a movie in itself, and of course you couldn't get everything in the book, so you did a great job of covering you know, what you could, and uh, uh, that's about all I can, I'm running out of time here. So uh, maybe someday uh, we'll cover more on what, uh, what really happened. And uh, that's all I have to talk about for now.